Hey, this is Seeking Alpha's Investing Experts Podcast. I'm Rob Isbitz, Seeking Alpha contributor under the profile Sun Garden Investment Publishing. My friend Matthew Tuttle of Tuttle Capital Management is with me again. He is a fellow Seeking Alpha contributor, a highly experienced trader, and an ETF innovator. So we hope you can learn from our experience by listening to this podcast and following us on Seeking Alpha. Now, Matthew, the uh, working theme for today is this. The key to investing success is being wrong a lot. So, yeah, Richard Dennis and Bill Eckhart, you know, real quickly, were extremely successful traders in the 70s. And they made a bet about whether trading can be taught or whether it's innate. And, you know, not unlike the movie Trading Places, they went out and hired a bunch of people, gave them their system and tried to figure out, you know, whether these people could be profitable with their system. Um, you know, I think the results were, were somewhat mixed, but the idea I'm getting at is that the turtle system was extremely profitable for a bunch of these traders. The win ratio on their trades was about 30%. So they only won about a third of their trades. But what they did is they cut their losses and let their profits run. So they made extraordinary amounts of money because occasionally they would hook a monster and they would let that run and then they'd have a lot of small losses. I don't want to invest $100 and uh, see it go to 50 on the way to going to 200 because first of all, it's a long road. And secondly, that is what they call dead money for a long time. Um, you know, I pointed out in one of my articles recently that we're going on two years of flat. So as great as this year has been, even for an S&P investor, you still haven't made up for last year. Well, and, and you brought up an important point. The, the dead money point from the standpoint of lost opportunity cost is huge. So you look at like 2000 to 2010, the lost decade, and, you know, a buy and hold time in the market versus not time in the market guy would argue well, you know, OK, yeah, you didn't make money for 10 years, but if you held that entire period, you didn't lose either. Great. But if we assume that, you know, our investing life cycle is, let's say, 60 years, you lose 10 of those. That's a big chunk that, you know, those are 10 years you never get back. To me, that's a huge deal. I'm 59. OK, I cannot afford to give away the next decade, nor can anybody my age, nor can anybody your age or a few years younger. Uh, and unfortunately, I think that that is what gets lost with the passage of time, because that's exactly what happened. Shout out to uh, uh, Ben Carlson uh, and his uh, uh, broadcast partner, Michael Batnick. Uh, uh, they, uh, they do something called Animal Spirits. Uh, ben mentioned me and a little conversation we were having on uh, Twitter, X, whatever, uh, last week. Uh, I tuned into uh, his uh, uh, podcast, latest podcast episode uh, yesterday. I was like, oh, he's talking about our, conversa our conversation. But here's one of the things I mentioned in that. Uh, the debate was over uh, sort of 60, 40 portfolios. But I think the key point related to what you were just saying is this. From 1969 to 1979... The return of the S&P 500, total, total, 4%. Not 4% a year, 4%, 10 years. From 1999 to 2009, you and I both lived through this. Uh, I actually managed a mutual fund through part of it um, and certainly managed private client accounts for, law, for, for all of it, or just about all of it. Uh, 1999 to 2009, the S&P's return, cumulative, Minus 24%. I think it was 12 or 13 years before you finally made it back to even, at least on the price-based S&P 500. Is that kind of what you're talking about when it's like, and, and yeah, maybe bonds will bail you out. Maybe they won't. But, but let's face it, today's investor culture uh, on Seeking Alpha and everywhere else is an equity culture. Yeah, and th that's exactly what I'm talking about. And that also assumes that 
you can hold the entire time. It's, it, it's, it's one thing to look at, you know, a chart and say like, you know, hey, yeah, all right, from 2000 to 2010, we didn't make any money, but, you know, I, I would have held. It's another thing to have a million dollars and be right near retirement in October of 07, and then be sitting there in March of 09 with $400,000 and being nowhere near retirement and having years of your savings wiped out. So yeah, you know, all right, you know, hey, it'll come back, but you know, when, how much further is it gonna go down? At some point, You've just got to stop the bleeding. You can't assume that people are just automatically going to hold through these epic drawdowns. Taking big shots with small amounts of money, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, there's a lot of risk in those right now, yeah? How is that informing what you're doing, what you're following? Let's start to get into naming some names here. Yeah, so, and, and, I'm re- and, and we're taping this on... You know, the last day of the month, um, Friday, we've got the payroll numbers, which I think are, are going to be an important number as far as the market. You know, then we, I believe we're off Monday and then September starts. And you've seen a lot of, you know, you've seen low volume for a lot of this month, especially this week. You know, you've seen a decline this month, which is either you know, markets got overbought and just needed to correct a bit or, you know, the beginning of something, you know, why are rates, 10-year rates, which we've talked about over 4%. So I am really waiting until September. Let's see what happens. Jobs number tomorrow. Everybody comes back from vacation. And now we've got the last part of the year. You know, what, what, what's going to happen so, you know, I am, like I've said before, T-bill and cash heavy, waiting to see how all of that plays out. And, you know, then I'll decide, you know, do I want long? Do I want short? You know, where do I want to go? You know, my, my favorite area at the moment is the precious metals miners. Uh, more, more the golds than the silvers at, at the moment. Um, you know, to me, those are a play on rates and the dollar coming down where, you know, I think the, you know, short treasuries, long dollar trade probably got overcrowded. Past couple of days, we're seeing that start to come down. If that does, I think the safer way to kind of play things is with the gold miners, potentially the silver miners. You get a little bit of flight to safety in there where theoretically if regional banks really tank, which I think is a possibility, you may have some people moving towards gold. So, you know, I like the gold miners better than you know, say the AI stocks or, you know, the Arky names or, you know, trying to buy, you know, a Magnificent Seven stock that's up a ridiculous amount this year. Um, And you could do all of that. But I really like uh, I like I like to play them with the gold miners better than than some of those other things. Uh, You mentioned gold. okay? and here's a perfect example of, of to me what today's market is. okay? So I have owned, uh, symbol is dust, D-U-S-T, okay? It's double short the gold mining stocks, all right? And look, I've been a chartist for 43 years. You've been a chartist for decades. And uh, the charts don't even work the way they used to. But more than that, just don't move with any sort of level of permanence. So great, I've made money, you know, it's having a nice move uh, today. But, you know, I'm still down 10%. Uh, it's a teeny tiny position because levered and the whole thing. But, but uh, yeah, almost like an experiment. You have to make the decision that, hey, there's not enough clarity here. And so I better rent a lot of stuff and not seek to own. So, I mean, one thing you said, which I think is very important about charts 
And, you know, I, I would agree that charts don't work like they used to from the standpoint of, I think, most people who look at charts, what they learned about charts came from, like, you know, the Bill O'Neill school. Or or more recently, the TikTok school. Then, you you know, you've got the Mark Minervini's and people like that who kind of followed in Bill O'Neill's footsteps. And the idea is buying things that break out. And I think that has become very problematic. Markets work differently than they did back in Bill O'Neill's time. And so one thing I would put out there as, you know, my two cents on charts and the way I read charts is I look for counter trend signals. I am not looking to buy breakouts. I think if you're watching something and it breaks out, then you are too late. You should have been buying that when that was pulling back into some sort of support, you know, undercutting in an important area and then moving back above, not breaking out to new highs. And remember, market dynamics are constantly changing you know, you can have the best methodology in the world and the market can make it obsolete the next day. And I think that's the one benefit you and I get from experience where, you know, and and I interact with people on Twitter a lot. And you've got a lot of people whose investing life cycle is, you know, post COVID to now. And, you know, and you and I have been around. I mean, I, I've had the holy grail. I've had methodologies that were a license to print money that then stop working because market dynamics change. Time frame. I mentioned this to a lot of people in the comments. They say, wait a minute, but but I understand what you're saying, but but what you're missing is that I didn't buy everything to hold until the same end date, okay? So as an example, I own XLG and PSQ. XLG is the top 50 stocks. And granted, these are all tactical positions. They could change quickly and change by our next recording. But uh, XLG is the top uh, 50 stocks by uh, weight and PSQ is short the NASDAQ. They are fairly similar. Uh, The XLG position is uh, uh, quite a bit bigger than the PSQ uh, inverse NASDAQ. Uh, I also wrote a uh, Seeking Alpha article uh, saying it was a strong buy on uh, PSQ, uh, but it's in the context of a larger portfolio. And so pairing those two up, uh, my goal is that one of them is going to make me money sooner and one of them is going to make me money later. In other words, is the market going to go up or down over the next several months and weeks? The answer is yes. It's probably going to do both. And I will have exit points for each one. Quickly, the others uh, are smaller positions. I mean, uh, FNGX, uh, sorry, FNGS, Microsectors Fang Index, supplement that position a little bit. Okay, so again, I have some things that they're not identical, but they do kind of rhyme with each other, uh, you know, because I'm kind of playing both sides against the middle, if you will. Uh, I am short the REITs through REK, another little own, uh, little known uh, ETF. Um, I see a possible pocket of opportunity temporarily in uh, mortgage REITs. They also pay very high dividend yields, but I'm not sure if I'll stick around for that. The symbol is REM. I own that. Uh, also, greatest band in history, REM. But a side note, uh, I own uh, EMTY. I don't know if you're familiar with that one, but uh, basically what it what it does is uh, it, it tries to profit from a decline in the the brick and mortar retail economy at the expense of the digital real the economy. Uh, I own VIXM, small position. That's uh, uh, intermediate term um, uh, VIX uh, call options. Uh, in other words, uh, if, if we have an Armageddon event one day or one week or one month, uh, that thing will fly out of nowhere. So I'd rather kind of like you say, you have to be there before it happens. Uh, that's sort of my little example of that I mentioned dust. 
uh, let's say very slight uh, short uh, Bitcoin uh, after that huge runoff. That's exactly what you were talking about, looking for reversals. I have a very small uh, inverse NVIDIA, uh, again, on the idea that maybe it can't go up forever, but I wouldn't be putting, you know, even 3% of my portfolio in that. Uh, same with Tesla on the short side. Uh, and here's the last one, okay? The symbol is URA. And uh, that is the Global X Uranium ETF. It's uranium, it's uranium stocks. And you're right, it has gone up. However, I bought it fairly recently because I finally had enough cojones to say, you know what? This looks like it's as close as I've seen to what I would call confirmed breakout going to old high as I have seen. So I'm looking to kind of get, let's call it the last part of the meat of the move, even though I have missed some of the meat of the move. Uh, again, you know, these are all, you know, uh, uh, about as permanent as uh, baseball fans will remember, uh, as permanent as Billy Martin was when George Steinbrenner hired him to be uh, the Yankees manager. You know, these are tactical positions and they're all intended to work together as a portfolio. But I have to tell you that URA, uh, the, the uranium position, again, just based on the chart work, this is the way the way setups occur and how you make money as a tactical investor, or it's going to be the 29th time this year where uh, I've said to myself, boy, charts don't work the way they used to, because this thing seems to have a lot of good momentum. What, one of the drawbacks of rotating around your watch list is a name you typically watch falling off and missing it. So CCJ is a uranium name that... Biggest holding in URA. It, it's one of my favorite names to watch. Uh, this latest move, I wasn't watching it. I missed it. Um, to me, at the moment, it's extended. So for my methodology, I would not be buying it. But CCJ is a name I love. If it, you know, dips back down into support, then it may be something that I would buy. And I'd probably buy CCJ over URA just because I prefer individual names. And I, and I, I went through the same thing. I was thinking about it, you know, and I, and I own some call options on U, uh, URA too. But I, uh, they're almost interchangeable because CCJ is, uh, I can't remember, it's, it's like 20-something percent of, of URA. So, okay, good. Well, we'll, uh, we'll definitely come back to that one and see how it did. And guess what, Matthew Tuttle? If, uh, if I was totally wrong on it, okay, fine. That's part of the part of the business, you know. Uh, uh, most baseball players are pretty happy, you know, if uh, if they hit 300 and get on base 35, 40 percent of the time. You were saying before about how, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, it's not, let's say, the wins and losses. It's kind of the weighted, the 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 weighted wins over the small losses, right? Well, and 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 also, I would just argue you can't be wrong if you follow your rules. I mean, the only times you know, to me, the only time I'm wrong is if I don't follow my rules. If I follow my rules and I lose money, I mean, that's you know that that that's part of investing. You can't. You're not going to make money every single time, every single day, every single month, every single year. You have to risk money to make money. And when you risk money to make money, you're going to buy a stock, you're going to buy an ETF that's going to lose. But as long as you follow your methodology, as long as it's not a stupid methodology, then you cannot be wrong. So, uh, thanks for listening to the Investing Experts podcast. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice of any sort. At times, myself, Rob Isbitz, and my co-pilot here, Matthew Tuttle, or any of the guests we may have on, may own positions in the securities mentioned. 
You can follow me on Seeking Alpha under the profile name Sun Garden Investment Publishing. Matthew Tuttle's Seeking Alpha profile name is Tuttle Capital Management. We also invite you to join the thousands of people who follow the Investing Experts podcast on Seeking Alpha, where you'll find full transcripts for all episodes. To take advantage fully of Seeking Alpha, become a premium subscriber. You can learn more at seekingalpha.com slash subscriptions. See you next time.